On Guido Talks this week, we're revisiting Labour Conference. The highs, the lows, the other lows. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Guido Talks. I'm Christian Calgi and I'm joined by Guido Forks founder Paul Staines. We've also got two new faces to introduce reporters Adam Cherry and Sabrina Miller. It is great to be here with you today. It's very good. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's an odd one for me because, as I'm sure we'll get into shortly, uh, this isn't the... I'm not an entirely new face of the Guido scene. I have, did, have been editing this podcast and I did edit for several months. So... It's a bit odd to be on the other end of, uh, of the camera, but looking forward to it. Very, very happy to be here. So I think what the viewers want to know is why the rest of us are in situ and you appear to be coming from your bedroom, Adam. Yes. Um, so I have spent the last five days at Labour Conference. Uh, it was very, very enjoyable, but with great regret, I have come home uh, with a mild bout of uh, the thing called the coronavirus. So unfortunately... <laughs> I am reporting from my bedroom in my COVID secure bunker for the next 10 days. Uh, these are the things we do for you know, the love of getting a scoop. Here we are. I mean, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? Because the Labour Party have been at the forefront of uh, trying to keep a lot of COVID restrictions on our lives. They've constantly been complaining about Tory MPs in the House of Commons not wearing face masks and yet one of the first things you observed at the start of Labour conference was there weren't any masks uh they the party gave up on uh asking for Covid passports on the door because of and I quote the weather uh and 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 you know uh, all the MPs were there singing and doing karaoke in crowded rooms you know for, for three days straight so I suppose it was maybe to be expected. Possibly, yeah. I mean, I'm not, uh, I'm not suggesting they should be enforcing social distancing or any of those measures at this point. Pretty much everybody is double vaxxed and those that aren't, clean, aren't interested in, in doing so. So we shouldn't worry about that. It's just the, the hypocrisy of it was quite alarming. You, I, as soon as I arrived, the whole conference venue was covered in these hands, face, space posters, although nothing mentioning ventilation. But anyway, um, posters everywhere all over the main conference hall itself, right above the, the massive podium. And with the exception of maybe Ed Miliband once, I didn't see any Labour politician, uh, Labour MP, certainly no one in the shadow cabinet wearing a face mask. And we were packed like sardines for the entire event, um, as I'm sure we'll mention later on uh, when I went to see uh, Comrade Burko. We, <laughs> we actually got forced out of the, we got forced out of the room um, because they hadn't put the chairs out for him. They presumably forgot he was coming. So we were, we were packed in this tiny little corridor, shoulder to shoulder, for a, a very long time. So, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised that I'm reporting from the COVID bunker at this point. Um, but yeah, you're right. They also abandoned COVID passports two days into a five-day conference. So they clearly didn't care that well, much. Well, you, you, you will be sorely missed from Tory conference, which, of course, kicks off... Uh, I suppose late on Saturday evening, Sunday morning. Uh, but I expect the the mood at Tory conference to be slightly less fraught and tense than what Labour. Uh, went into Brighton experiencing because, of course, the conference started with this uh, ridiculous. Uh, row about whether they should reform the way the leader is elected. Presumably, Starmer uh, is already thinking about the next leadership election, which is not a sign of great confidence in his own ability uh, to stay on as leader, perhaps. Uh, and, and, and this really was the mood going in. So what was it like on the, on the ground, Adam? Well, obviously, I was able to speak to people and get a more candid view of, of their impression of the of the party and the leadership because I wasn't wearing a Guido badge. So what they were telling me was what they were really thinking. And it wasn't a happy family. Yeah, there was, it felt like, uh, it, it does feel like there was a sort of Labour civil war brewing, at least on the, for the first couple of days. The, the serious cranks and the usual suspects were thankfully outside because they were at the alternative conference, the world transformed. But even within the conference hall, no one seemed particularly happy to be there. It wasn't this sort of jubilant return to normality. There wasn't this impression that uh, there was, they weren't glad to see Keir in his first performance as leader. It was very hostile and, 
and not necessarily unpleasant, but not enjoyable. And of course, that then fed through to the sort of half-hearted heckling. Obviously, you know, the like the Kinnock days and and, and the, even the Corbyn days saw better heckling during a leader's speech, as far as <laughs> I was concerned. But it was still fairly entertaining, wasn't it? I imagine to see. Uh, in real time, what the cameras weren't necessarily able to pan around and pick up in terms of interruptions and sign waving and, and, and all the other stuff we saw. Yeah, I mean, obviously going into that uh, that session, everyone knew, everyone sort of expected those uh, heckles to take place. So I had my camera ready and was darting around trying to find where the next interruption was going to come from. <laughs> so uh, Starmer wasn't the only you know only one who'd been prepared for that sort of thing. Um, yeah, uh, at, on the conference, on his speech specifically, and I'm sure we'll talk more in, in more detail about this later on, it, I felt like the hecklers were in a real minority there, despite the mood on the ground throughout the week being one of, of, uh, of well, of unhappiness, I suppose. Once Starmer started speaking and he had his first rebuttal, his pre-prepared line about saving lives or changing lives or shouting slogans once that once he deployed that sort of stuff the crowd were on his side and so with each passing heckle they were they were in a smaller and smaller minority and i actually felt like in that respect he handled he handled that reasonably well um so i don't think they necessarily hurt him i thought one of the best judge heckles was just during that bit of the speech where starmer was talking about the nhs pay and someone shout out 15 pounds per hour yeah because the debate about minimum wage has been sort of a key issue at this labor party conference because keir starmer told his andy mcdonald and the rest of his cabinet that they can no longer ca campaign for a 15 pound minimum wage and this was a huge issue for a lot of members of the labor party including andy mcdonald who resigned over this and sort of a lot of sort of left-leaning people sort of showed huge amounts of solidarity with Andy for this decision, including the Baker's Union, Navara Media, Momentum, they were all slamming Keir Starmer for his outrageous decision to actually raise the minimum wage from £8.90 to £10 and not the full way to the £15 that, that they want. But then Guido did some digging and we found out that all of these organisations that have been sort of lambasting Keir actually aren't even paying their staff this minimum wage that they're campaigning for. So Navara Media, I believe, recently advertised, I think in January 2021, advertised for a social media manager, and they were only going to pay them £12.50, which, you know, if the minimum wage was £10, that would be a really reasonable amount to pay. But if they're campaigning for a minimum wage to be £15, they're £2.50 short of that. Same with the Bakers Union, who disaffiliated from the Labour Party over the same £15 minimum wage, are sort of hiring people for £12 per hour. Momentum as well, we found sort of scores of these job adverts where the same people that are ardently campaigning for this £15 minimum wage aren't even willing to pay its own employees this amount, which is just sort of burning hypocrisy. So naturally, sort of, we called them all out for it, um, and they were not particularly happy with us about that, especially sort of the folks at Navarra Media who were very angry to be called out for their hypocrisy, um, sort of so much so that they started launching personal attacks at the Guido team, well, um, they do, calling they do us say, clapped and, and all sorts. They do say now that they are paying not just £15, £16.50. So if we contributed to the workers having higher wages at Navarra, well, up the workers, we also had a look at, um, just recently, all the Momentum campaigners um, only getting... Uh, in fact, I, I don't think any of the Momentum campaigners were on £15 an hour. Only the senior management were, the boss class, so to speak. So I hope the Momentum campaigners get the £15 an hour <laughs> they're campaigning for as well. And of course, of course Keir Starmer uh, is, uh, had to go on Beth Rigby uh, and explain why he'd allowed his shadow employment minister to resign over a £15 minimum wage policy when Keir Starmer himself has spent the last uh, <coughs> three or four years as an MP joining McDonald's workers at the picket line who themselves are demanding a £15 minimum wage. So Starmer's happy to try and get McDonald's staff 
uh, a £15 minimum wage, but understands that businesses elsewhere in the economy would not be able to cope with a £15 minimum wage. Um, of course, it sort of looks like he's a sleeper agent for the the manufacturers of those touchscreen kiosks that McDonald's are now replacing all their <laughs> staff with, uh, which is the natural conclusion of forcing uh, what is a over £5 increase to the minimum wage, seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, well, and I think, I think nowhere. a number it's of people... out of nowhere, Calgary. Uh, the, the, whole, s- the whole campaign is based on a big US campaign for $15 an hour. Well, $15 is, by my calculations, roughly £11 which doesn't sound half as crazy as £15, which is more than most of the country gets, even if they're experienced. Never mind a starting entry job at McDonald's on £15. Another point on this topic. Last week, we also revealed that the uh, stewards at Labour Conference, many of whom I encountered on my travels last week, uh, <laughs> were themselves being paid, was it £9? Someone fact check me. Was it £9? It was £9.75. £9.75, right? So... Uh, Jeremy, I think, as you pointed out uh, today on GB News, um, Christian, uh, I think Kira is happier for his for his own staff to be paid below ten pounds. Yet is uh, campaigning for McDonald's workers beyond fifteen. So the people who are keeping him safe uh, are worth less than the people who are uh, working at fast fast food counters, right? So and it's a bit, you know, and- it's a bit of. It's a bit of a kick in the teeth, isn't it, to have to <laughs> sort of oversee these conference hall debates on minimum wage being raised to fifteen pounds when you yourself are not even being paid the ten pounds yeah. that Keir Starmer thinks you should be paid. Yeah, yeah, fifteen pounds an hour works out to over thirty-one thousand pounds a year. If you think that is that should be the national living or the minimum wage, not even the national living wage. Who knows what that should be? The minimum wage. Then you know, I think it, we're going to come to trouble. Some Labour MPs who deserve to be on fifteen pounds an hour, <laughs> <laughs> rather than what they're currently on. Certainly, uh, away from the turgid debates, the resignations, the quittings, and the all-round ruthless nature of a Labour conference, uh, there were some uh, happier moments. And when I say happier, of course, I mean completely sloshed. And Adam was on hand to go and participate in some of those more entertaining evening sessions. Adam, what did you get up to? What did you see? Uh, okay, right. So I, I, I've tried to, I think I've, you know, suppressed a lot of this. So um, there are a couple of karaoke sessions. There was, on the final night, there was the, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard about this already, there was the Daily Mirror's uh, karaoke night, <coughs> which is, who knows where I put my... <laughs> that wasn't... That the you didn't, you didn't, you didn't actually different. perform, did you, Adam? <laughs> I can't blame your throat on, on a rendition of, of a, presumably an Oasis song would be your, your go-to yeah, that, repertoire. That would be my thing. And in fact, Angie did sing uh, a, bit, a spot of Oasis, which I was very happy about. So there was that, yeah, there was the karaoke. There was Labour List karaoke a couple of nights before, although um, there weren't many MPs who showed up to that one. They were saving up for the big night on, uh, on the Tuesday. Um... Navarra Media and The World Transformed had their alternative conference, as usual, down about a 15-minute walk outside of the conference centre. Uh, a lot of fun to be had there. I went along to the, uh, the final speech, which is sort of like their Avengers Assemble for all the, you know, all the great and good <laughs> from the far left. So you had Corbyn, you had McDonald, uh, Zara Sultana, uh, Bergen, you, you name it, they were there. Um, from that, I would say they were very interested in calling Keir Starmer Keith. They were very interested in talking about how unfairly treated by the media they were. Didn't mention Boris Johnson much. Didn't mention trying to actually win a general election and, and enact any of these uh, policies. It was all about ideological purity. Actually, it was, and I'm not the first person to say this, it was sort of Trumpian in the way that they were presenting it. It was very hostile, very insular. It was surprisingly... Uh, of course, one of the uh, speeches at this uh, fringe event went down really well with our audience, and it was by Richard Bergen, of all people, who who actually did quite an entertaining, uh, gag-worthy parody of Keir, uh, of, Keir uh, of Neil Kinnock's infamous 1985 uh, speech, uh, where he was talking about how the far left had taken over Liverpool Council and was yeah. running it into the ground. Uh, I think we can we can see a clip of that now. So we saw how we started this conference. We started it with the two words on the lips 
of all my constituents in the pubs and clubs and in the living rooms and in the parks and those two words that my constituents say to me most often are Electoral College! What a joke! What a joke! But what a sick joke when you see what the Tories are doing and that's the best we can come up with. The truth is, the Tories, the way they've handled this pandemic, have got blood on their hands. And the best the Labour leadership could come up with was bloody rule changes. And it ended, it ended in the grotesque chaos of a Labour leader a Labour leader scurrying around Brighton trying to draft the terms of his own redundancy notice. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. If you're new to the show, remember you can subscribe to catch all future episodes and we're available on all good podcasting platforms. If you're just listening to the audio, you can check out our Beautiful Faces version of the show on YouTube and subscribe there. We're going to leave you now with a particular highlight of Labour Conference and that is Angela Rayner's cover of the Grease Megamix. See you soon. You are the one who